Hello, I'm Dr. Sam Hancock of the Emerald Planet and Emerald Planet TV. We come to you on a week-to-week -week basis from Washington, D.C. in the United States as we look around the globe in 144 different nations looking for those thousand best practices, the technology, services, and products that are making a difference as we move through the 21st century. And as we have a planet of 9 billion people by 2038 and possibly 12 to 13 billion by the end of this century, how are we going to be able to take care of all these people on planet Earth? And that's what Emerald Planet's all about. We come to you looking at the solutions, the best practices from around the globe as we create the Emerald Planet. Hello, welcome to the Emerald Planet. We're making a difference as we move through the 21st century. And see the long-term impacts of climate change. But we're glad to have you. Thank you for being with us. Looking at nature around us, we have many creatures that we see, sometimes just ignore, but yet are critical to life here on planet Earth. Uh, the bees, the birds, the bats, everything has its place. And at the same time, the food production is actually aided and abetted by all these creatures that we have around us. Now, we're going to be talking about pollination and pollinators and why they're so critically important and what we as humans need to do to protect them. We have an expert that's gonna be talking about this. This is Carrie L. Wexted. She is the education outreach specialist for what's called the Wildlife and Heritage Service at the Maryland Department of Natural Resources. And we're gonna be talking about what's pollination and why should we care. Carrie, welcome to the Emerald Planet TV. Thank you, I'm very excited to be here. Tell us a, a little bit about the mission and the vision of the Maryland Department of Natural Resources. So the Department of Natural Resources leads Maryland in securing a sustainable future for our environment, society, and economy by preserving, protecting, restoring, and enhancing the state's natural resources. Within the department, the Wildlife and Heritage Service, which I work for, um, is tasked with conserving Maryland's diverse wildlife plants and the natural communities that support them using scientific expertise and informed public um, input. Well, it's really critical and also it's quite beautiful, the work that you're actually doing. So tell us a little bit about what is pollination and the obvious question is, why should we care about it? So pollination, um, the ultimate goal of most living organisms is to create the next generation of offspring. And plants, reproduction often occurs via pollination. So pollination is the transfer of pollen from the male parts of the flower to the female parts of the flower. Now looking at the monarch butterfly, that really is the poster child as far as pollination is concerned, but also the beauty of nature. Why are monarchs, but they're just a, a cast or one uh, part of thousands of different pollinators. Why is that really such an example of pollination that most uh, people resonate with? I think a lot of it is due in part to their beauty. They're very gorgeous butterflies. In addition, they have a lot of cultural significance too. Uh, they have multi-generational migration and it expands all the way from Canada down to Mexico each year. So it captivates a very, very large audience. Now looking at the, the flowers, the plants, and then the pollinators themselves, tell us about this process. It's very <laughs> complex. Uh, it's evolved over millions of years, and yet it's critically important not only to uh, the individual plants and their species, but also to human life as well. Yes. So pollination, again, is that transfer of pollen from the male, um, male parts to the female parts of the flower. And in this diagram, you can see the stamens, which are the male parts, and at the tips, there are these things called anthers. In the center of the diagram, you'll see the pistil, which is the female part. And at the tip of the pistil, there's a spot called the stigma, which accepts the pollen. Essentially, once pollen hits that stigma, if it's from the same species, it's going to travel down that tube called the style into the ovary, which is at the base of the pistil. And then it's going to interact with the unfertilized eggs or ovules there in the ovary. 
successful fertilization is going to result in the development of seeds and roots. Now that's absolutely incredible. But looking at this is the talking about the different ways that pollination occurs, and then we'll get into the pollinators themselves. What well, what are the different ways that we're looking at actually in this photograph? So pollination can occur in many ways. Um, some plants like corn use wind to assist with moving pollen from plant to plant. And then other uh, plants use water as a pollen vector. And then we have plants um, like the orchid in the middle there that can actually self-pollinate by this species in particular has the, the pollen kind of dangling over the stigma and it just drops down and fertilizes itself. However, many of the world's plants uh, use some type of animal to move that pollen from one plant to another. And the first records of animal assisted pollination are from around 100 million years ago. Beetles were among the first pollinators as well as wasps. Yeah, that's absolutely amazing. Looking at this photograph, uh, this really summarizes what's going on in this pollination process. Tell us what we're actually seeing here. Essentially, by having an animal move that pollen for you, um, you're moving it greater distances than what you could usually do just as a plant. If you think about it, plants are kind of rooted there and, and really can't move along. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, so that animal, animal mediated pollination helps that pollen to travel further distances and also helps with that genetic diversity. That's absolutely fantastic. Now we're looking uh, at a bee and we're calling it an animal. So some people may be confused. We think of uh, deer and squirrels and rabbits and, you know, hundreds of other varieties, uh, but you're calling this bee and uh, the pollinators that we're talking about as animals. Why are we calling it an animal? Well, the majority of animal species worldwide lack backbones like this bee. So over 90% of our, our described species are what we call invertebrates. So it's not just the big uh, furry and, and feathery animals that are part of the animal kingdom. Uh, very, very important. Now, looking at this, this is, again is a good way to exhibit what's going on and how pollination occurs. Tell us what we're seeing here. So this is a picture of two ruby-throated hummingbirds, and essentially it's showing you kind of the co-evolution of the design of the flowers and the pollinators, because these relationships have evolved over mi millions of years. Those tubular flowers are designed for something with a long tongue to get down in there and get to the nectar, but you can see on the left-hand side of the photo that stamen right above the female's head, that's designed to deposit that pollen on her head. So making sure that that plant gets fertilized in the process. So looking at the, the plants and animals, uh, really it's coexisting, and but it's evolving over time. We have a tendency as humans to think everything is static. Uh, and then all of a sudden science comes in and we're uh, changing everything. But what I think what you're saying is, is that these plants and animals are evolving over a period of time and actually changing themselves. Yes. Yeah, when you, um, self-fertilization will work, but you don't get that exchange of genetic material from another individual. And variety is the spice of life that allows us to evolve and um, deal with different changes in our environments. So it's really important that we have that. Looking at this chart, this is really quite complex. Uh, yet yeah, gives us an overview of uh, all the different ways that plants, uh, animals interact, and also as far as the pollination, the fertilization. What are we actually seeing here? Well, oftentimes you can look at a flower and figure out some clues on their pollination strategy. And pollination syndromes, which is shown on this chart, are suites of flower traits that have evolved in response to natural selection imposed by different pollen vectors. So for example, plants are going to put energy into showy flowers that smell good to attract animals. They don't need to bother with that if they're just putting all their pollen out into the wind. So they're not going to have colorful petals or special scents. And also uh, looking at, you know, we see the bees, the birds, uh, the butterflies, you know, that gives everybody a warm, uh, cozy feeling. Uh, but you see bats and beetles and flies in this mix as well. So. Uh, how do we need to protect all living creatures so that uh, the nature of life continues to evolve? 
Essentially, they're all part of a web, and they provide pollination services that benefit not only us, but also other organisms. Bats, for example, pollinate a lot of different fruit crops, and they also help pollinate things like agave, which brings us tequila. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a good thing. Uh, but flies, <laughs> that's kind of an ooh uh, factor there, but uh, they're critical as far as pollination, correct? Yes, yeah, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Okay. Uh, looking at the diversity that we're seeing here, tell us what we're actually seeing and why this mix of images for us to understand this process as far as what pollination is all about. So this is just showing you some examples of those pollination syndromes. Flowers that are purple and stinky, like the pawpaw in the left picture, are pollinated by flies. So their strategy is to resemble rotting flesh to attract their pollinators. And I find it really amusing that a gorgeous flower like that pawpaw can smell so bad. Mm. <laughs> so, and pawpaws produce edible fruits that have a banana custard-like taste, and they were actually George Washington's favorite fruit. Mm. That's a good historical antidote. Looking at the, the bee and then uh, the other flower. So the golden rods there in the center, they have those showy yellow flowers and those are designed to attract bees. And the red tubular flowers like the cardinal flower are attractive in our area to hummingbirds. So again, it has that design very similar to the plant that I showed earlier, where it has those red tubes that essentially um, need somebody with a long tongue to get down in there. That's fantastic. Now, looking at the fruits and vegetables in front of us, uh, we don't really think about this. We just think we go to the grocery store and we buy what we need or go to the farmer's market. Uh, but there's a lot of other beings out there, plants and animals, uh, that are critical to us having this food. Is that what we're seeing here? Yes. In the United States, almost one third of all of our agricultural output depends on pollinators. So. If you like to eat, you should thank a pollinator. <laughs> and about 90% of our nation's apple crop is pollinated by bees, just to give you an example. So looking at the fruits and vegetables in front of us, Carrie, uh, there's a great uh, number and diversity of pollinators then that are actually bringing us these fruit and vegetables on a day-to-day -day basis in reality, correct? Yes, yeah, it's, uh, and some of it depends on the different flower structures produced by those plants and also where they evolved. So North American fruits and vegetables like squashes are going to uh, have better pollination strategies with the pollinators that were here in North America that evolved with them. Uh, good, uh, uh, the specialization. Chocolate, most people love chocolate, uh, but tell us a little bit about that because you were sharing that earlier as far as what is the real pollinator for chocolate? Yeah, so this is this is why we need flies. Um, because if you like chocolate like me, you have to thank the flies. There's a special type of midge that can only pollinate these um, chocolate flowers. They have these tiny little hoods that hide the, the stamens. And so that little midge kind of pushes its way into those, um, those flowers and pollinates it. Now, certainly other things can help pollinate it, but those flies are the best at it and they're going to give us the best chance of success of having a chocolate crop. Oh, that sounds absolutely great. I'm going to move through this and I'm going to end up here. Why do we need to protect the, the animals and broad category of animals to pollinate our food? And we have about 20 seconds to do that, Carrie. Well, pollinators are more than important just for us. They're important for healthy ecosystems. They assist with plant reproduction and feed other animals, like the warbler pictured there. Dr. Doug Tallamy at the University of Del Delaware has quantified the importance of insects for our songbirds. And um, over 90% of them need to feed their, in uh, their young insects. So it's keeping that food web together. Fantastic. Uh, this is Carrie L. Wexted, Education Outreach Specialist, Wildlife and Heritage Services at the Maryland Department of Natural Resources as we create the Emerald Planet. Looking at the uh, world of food, plants and animals, all this is very important for humankind. We all understand that. And there's millions of different actors that are involved in actually bringing us the food, not just the corporations and the big box department stores and groceries, 
uh, but really the plants and animals that surround us on a day-to-day -day basis. We're going to be learning about that as far as what is a pollinator. This is Carrie L. Wexted. She's the Education and Outreach Specialist, Wildlife and Heritage Services at the Maryland Department of Natural Resources. And Carrie, welcome to the Emerald Planet TV. Thank you. Uh, tell us why wildlife and heritage in the same service for the Maryland Department of Natural Resources. So the Wildlife and Heritage Service is made up of multiple different programs. We have our traditional wildlife programs that include the ducks and the bucks, and we have our natural heritage program, which also works with our what we call non-game species, or those that are rare, threatened, and endangered, and, and not hunted. So, um, so the Wildlife and Heritage essentially is a combination of both those um, organizations, essentially. And it, we all work together to ensure the long-term conservation of our native ecosystems, natural communities, and the species that are supported by them. That's absolutely fantastic. Uh, what is a pollinator? Let's just start off with that. So a pollinator is essentially an organism that moves pollen from one plant to another, um, or sometimes just even within a single plant. So a good example here is this bee, and it's on a passion flower, and all that yellow stuff right there is pollen that it's going to be moving along. Yeah, and looking at the color of the flower, why is it so colorful and it actually has these uh, very wispy forms? as well. Is this attractive to the bee? It is. And actually what bees see is very different than what we see. So bees see in the ultraviolet spectrum. And a lot of those designs look like neon flashing lights to those bees. Yeah, I tell you, this is really a beautiful plant. Now looking at this, we have this uh, mix. You got the hummingbird, but also we have the bat in this. And we kind of think of bats not really as pollinators and uh, we're kind of wondering uh, why that exists in nature, but these all coexist and are very important in very different ways because they have evolved together. Yeah, um, the diversity of pollinators is very diverse, just like the diversity of flowers and plants that are out there. So night blooming plants that are white and have strong fruity scents are usually attractive to bat pollinators. And bats are really important in tropical areas, not only for pollination, but also for seed dispersal to allow for that reproduction and traveling of those plants. Then we have things like birds, such as our hummingbirds, that um, are our only vertebrate pollinators or ones with backbones here in Maryland. Now, looking at the diversity, we're really seeing a diverse <laughs> sense as far as these uh, pollinators are concerned. So tell us how this mix is really important to us humans and to fathering actually the animal and the plant kingdom. Yeah, so these are just a sampling of some of the pollinators that people don't think of as pollinators. So there are very few mammal pollinators, but the black and white ruffed uh, lemur actually assist with pollination of traveler's palms. Um, so they, uh, they stick their faces down in those flowers and pick up all that pollen. And there are even some lizards and geckos that also help with pollination by essentially moving that pollen around. And the slugs can help too. So the picture on the far right is wild ginger, which can be found here in Maryland. It um, flowers on the ground. So little things like slugs and ants help it. Yeah, it's just amazing, the diversity. Looking at butterflies, though, this is something that uh, we really think about as far as pollinators and the butterflies. And how do they really aid and assist nature as far as pollination is concerned? Well, a lot of pollinators are really good at drinking nectar. Um, so they have those really long tongues, but they don't always have the parts to successfully move the pollen around. So some butterflies are better than others. Some of them have sticky brush feet that help pick up pollen. And some of them are a little hairier on the bottom that helps pick up pollen as well. But these are kind of the poster children of pollinators, particularly because they're so pretty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, do the colors actually aid in pollination? Or is this just how they've evolved over time uh, in concert with the plants? That's a good question. And I think a lot of the colors of these pollinators, at least for the um, for the butterflies, have evolved more for sexual selection within the species than um, than for pollination. 
So in other words, we really are aiding and abetting pollination. We just have to have them out there. So uh, yeah. either one way or the other. Uh, looking at uh, beetles and ants and all these other types of things, how do they help pollination? <laughs> Well, beetles were the first pollinators on the scene, and around the world, they're our most numerous invertebrate pollinators that we have. So, um, so that's a locust borer beetle that you'll often find in late summer in Maryland. And ants help with pollination. So, um, but a lot of what ants do is more seed dispersal related. So, um, much like butterflies, they're not as good at picking up that pollen and moving it around, but they do visit some flowers. And then we have moths that also help with pollination. And on the right-hand side, that's a daytime flying moth known as a hummingbird moth. Yeah, these are just really beautiful, though, in the diversity. Uh, just tell us more. I'm going to go through some of these uh, images that you've shared with us, and uh, I'll just chime in when I need to. Go ahead. <laughs> Well, these are really the big wigs of pollination in our area here. Wasp, bees, and flies. Um, they're the three that, that typically pick up the most pollen and are able to move it around. So a lot of people don't think of wasp as pollinators, but um, wasp were the second on the scene after beetles. And some species, like the yellow jacket pictured there, actually eat nectar and pollen as adults. So they're really important for pollination in their adult stage while they eat uh, insects for their juvenile stage. Then, of course, we have flies that do the same thing. And then our bees. They're so hairy. They're our best pollinators that we have around. Now, tell us what we're actually seeing here, uh, the physical makeup of this bee. Uh, you're highlighting it. Uh, it really is stylized. Uh, but actually, it's, it lo almost looks like a buffalo. <laughs> well, when most people think of bees, they think of this bee in particular. And this is the European honeybee. It's a species that's widely trafficked for um, pollination of agricultural crops. And um, they're extremely hairy, so you can see all of that. And uh, they also are gentlists. So that means that they really don't care what flowers they eat from. They'll eat from whatever you provide them. And they make honey, too. So... But in North America, the honeybees are kind of like the chickens of the bee world because they are an agricultural species. They're not one that's natural to our ecosystems. Now, you uh, had a question as far as uh, what are native uh, honeybees uh, to North America. Do we have such a critter? We don't have native honeybees, but we have a diversity of a lot of other bees that are found here in North America. And I think this is something we're looking at here. Tell us a little bit about this diversity and uh, and do these specialize as far as the pollination is concerned? So this graphic is from Sam Drogi, who works with the USGS Bee Lab. And uh, it's just a small sampling of the over 4,000 bee species that can be found in North America. Did you say 4,000? 4,000, 4, yes. That's incredible. It's incredible and, and you can see the diversity in shapes and sizes and colors and they have diversity in their techniques for pollination too. Like our bumblebees, they buzz and um, shake the pollen out. So it's called buzz pollination. And uh, of course there's some species that don't pollinate at all. They just steal from others, but that's a topic for another day. Okay, well, this is really interesting. Uh, social versus solitary. Tell us what we're looking at here. Uh, we can certainly understand the social part, but the solitary, that's an interesting one. Well, in Maryland, we have over 430 bees, and um, most of the species that we have are, have solitary nesting habits. And essentially, after mating, the females are responsible for finding or building a nest, provisioning it with food, laying her eggs, and sealing it up all by herself. <laughs> so that's a lot of work for a single mom, and they often have short lifespans. Um, in contrast with our social bees that include those European honeybees and some of our bumblebees, they have division of labor. They have a colony and somebody's job is to find the food while somebody else cares for the young and somebody else defends the nest. Now looking at uh, bringing the bees into uh, North America, you keep referring to these as the European uh, bees. Now why uh, Long ago, did they decide they really needed to be bringing these into uh, North America? In essence, now they've become almost as a, a native species. They were brought here for, um, for pollination and also for honey production because none of our native bees produce honey, at least in a, a quantity that could be harvested like those European honeybees. 
and this is what we're talking about here. Uh, share with us as far as the honey, why it's so important, and what is this actually bringing to uh, the plant kingdom by having honey? <laughs> well, honey is mainly for us, um, but the evolution of solitary versus social bees is really fascinating to me. Um, sociality occurred later in evolution, and the social bees and social wasps um, tend to be more defensive around their colonies. And that's because they've had to fend off larger predators like mammals, like us, mm -hmm. particularly the honeybees, if you think about them. Um, they had to evolve a venom that was reactive to humans and larger animals like bears that would get into their colonies. So if you think about snacking on a single flower tube with a couple of bee babies in it for a solitary bee, it doesn't provide a lot of nutrition to us. However, a honeybee colony has protein-rich babies dipped in honey, and so they had to evolve a venom that was essentially going to deter us from eating them. <laughs> I see. So that's really important and for their survival. Okay, tell us the difference in what we're seeing here, Carrie. So here are two examples of our solitary bees that are found in Maryland, and these are both ground nesting bees, so they spend most, most of their lives in the ground, and they're specialists, meaning that they only visit a, a select number of plants. The one on the left is the spring beauty bee. It's a tiny uh, woodland uh, bee, and it has the best schedule ever. It essentially is active from about 10 in the morning till 2.30 in the afternoon <laughs> when the temperatures are the warmest and they take rainy days off because it's not energetically, it doesn't make sense to, to uh, go out and forage when it's cold or wet out. So I'm down with that. <laughs> um, so the bee on the right is the squash bee and that's a gardener's friend. They live in the ground, usually close to our vegetable gardens. And as their name suggests, they pollinate squashes like zucchinis and pumpkins. And um, they have a very special relationship with that. Sometimes you can gently open up those flowers in the morning and you'll see the males snoozing inside. That's absolutely fantastic. Well, uh, we're out of time. Uh, if you can give me about uh, 10 seconds, what do you see for the future as far as wildlife and heritage services? Got to be quick. <laughs> the future of wildlife and heritage service, well, right now we're just working on sustaining our, our wildlife populations and um, just keeping up with current science and technology. That's fantastic. This is Carrie L. Wexted, Education Outreach Specialist in the Maryland Department of Natural Resources as we create the Emerald Planet. Looking at pollination and pollinators, this is really one of the critical stories of the climate change and the impacts that humans are having on nature, both the plants, the animals, and even the, the biome as far as the microorganisms. And so we have someone as a specialist is going to be talking about this, the pollinator decline and what we must do as humans to address this issue. This is Carrie L. Wanstead. She is the Education Outreach Specialist, Wildlife and Heritage Services for the Maryland Department of Natural Resources. And Carrie, welcome again to the Emerald Planet. Thank you, I'm happy to be back. Now, uh, looking at the Maryland Department of Natural Resources, uh, it's amazing the diversity and the span of life that you actually deal with, the plants, the animals, uh, even the, uh, the microscopic uh, beings that's uh, in the soil around all the plants, the trees. So how is the Mar Maryland Department of Natural Resources kind of put its arms around all this great amount of diversity and at the same time try to protect it from humankind and our encroachment on the land, uh, in the air, and the water. Well, we have to balance the needs of not only wildlife and nature, but also people, because people factor into the equation. And so we work a lot across the state of Maryland and also regionally and nationally, um, particularly for habitat conservation, to make sure that we have these habitats that support suites of species instead of just individual species. Yeah. Looking at pollinator decline, and uh, this is a very poignant photograph that you've taken. Uh, share what we're seeing here. We see the great beauty of this. What are we missing? 
So this picture I recently took in West Virginia in a natural area and uh, and essentially this plant is called bee balm and as its name suggests it's very attractive to bees and also to hummingbirds and a ton of other pollinators. This is a plant I often suggest to put out in gardens because of its attractiveness. However, nobody was visiting this patch. Hmm. I tell you, that's just absolutely incredible to think of that, uh, that we have, you know, these beautiful plants and we don't have the pollinators. But looking at this decline, as far as the uh, insects are concerned, why is it so critical that we know this fact and then why we need to be doing something about it? Globally, massive insect declines are being documented, and a recent study by York University researchers found that almost 94% of wild bee and native plant networks have been lost over the last 100 years. And to quote another researcher, Dr. Pedro Cardosa, who published some of the biodiversity loss research, he mentions with species loss, we lose not only another piece of the complex puzzle that is our living world, but also biomass, essential, for example, to feed other animals in the living chain, unique genes and substances that might contribute to cure diseases and ecosystem functions, which we depend upon. So I want to stay here for just a minute. This is really an interesting chart. And you had that statistic in the very beginning as far as the decline, the percentage. So if you mm -hmm. will share that again, and let's look at these species and how these are negatively impacting uh, because of their loss, not because there's too many of them. Yeah, so this graphic is just looking at the overall decline of species and their populations across the world in the last 10 years. And the 94% um, statistic that I shared is looking at relationships between bees and their plants. And that has declined by 94 for the last 100 years. Mm. So a tremendous amount of loss. Yeah, and also we're looking at these various species here uh, as far as the loss is concerned. Uh, what are we seeing here? Or what are we not seeing here? Well, some researchers have coined this loss as the windshield phenomenon. So if you drove around 20, 30 years ago, you might remember lots of bug guts on your car windows. It was annoying. I remember my dad's old truck wiper blades would never keep up and we had to hand scrub them off. But today that phenomenon has decreased and it's easy to see that indicator that insect populations have been declining. Yeah, it's just amazing. And, and I was uh, saying that in uh, kind of a, a laughing way as what we're not seeing because we don't really think about that. When we were children uh, going back, you know, a number of decades, we really did have a great amount of bugs, you know, squashed all mm -hmm. over the windscreen. And you're seeing this is perfectly clear. So uh, that really is an indicator of, of the loss that we've had as far as the natural world is concerned. Uh, what are we seeing here? Well, this is kind of a representation of climate change, which is a large driver of pollinator loss. Um, over the last hundred years or so, annual temperatures have changed by two and a half degrees, which might not seem like a lot, but it alters the time that plants are blooming, which is going to affect those relationships with those pollinators. It kind of throws them out of sync. In addition, things like drought can impact um, pollen and nectar production. So plants might not be uh, producing as much nectar to feed the pollinators if they're drought stressed, because they're kind of keeping that water for themselves. And then temperature can also drive things like migration. So these temperature swings, um, warmer temperatures mean that monarchs might stay in Canada longer and migrate south later. But when they do that, they face colder temperatures in some of the southern climates. And um, that's not conducive for travel. In addition, you throw in some extreme weather events and migration can be a lot more hazardous than usual. Yeah, and again, it just contributes to uh, declines and, and loss as far as the pollinators are concerned. And again, it goes directly related to the food and all that's very important. But also, what is the impact as far as insecticides and pesticides on pollinators, which are really necessary and needed as far as food production? Yeah, pesticides, and that includes insecticides, herbicides, and fungicides, they can all play a role in pollinator decline. And it's important to note just because a pesticide's labeled as organic doesn't mean um, necessarily that it's safe for pollinators. 
There are many considerations when choosing um, different pesticides options, including efficacy and specificity and costs and risks. And organizations like the Xerxes Society and Cornell have put out some really helpful guides on how to minimize the risk to pollinators. Overall, um, you have to think of like multiple pest management solutions, that integrated pest management. Leaving a sign up for just a minute, is there any way that we can actually do this naturally? Do uh, some of the pollinators actually uh, interact with each other so that some of the pests uh, may be reduced or do we need all of them equally? Well, certainly some of our pollinators do double duty, like our yellow jackets. They help eat pests in the garden while also helping to pollinate. And some of our flies do that as well. So that's the benefit of having a functioning ecosystem is you're going to have those checks and balances. Okay, that's absolutely wonderful. Looking at grass, everyone loves grass. We love to have it around. Uh, actually, uh, where I am now, I'm putting in uh, three rain and basecaping gardens, planted another uh, seven trees, uh, and trying to move away from just grass. Why is grass maybe uh, really having a negative impact on our native populations of pollinators? Well, habitat loss is one of the largest threats to biodiversity today, and that includes to our pollinators. And over 40 million acres across the United States is locked up in lawn. These lawns are often comprised of monocultures of non-native grasses that provide very little in the way of ecological benefits to pollinators and to other insects. And in some cases, these areas can serve as nursery habitat for pest species like Japanese beetles. So if you want to reduce your pesticide usage, you can get rid of your lawn. <laughs> Yeah, well, this is the whole thing as far as the uh, the rain gardens and the basecaping. Uh, it's very important to bring back these native uh, species. Uh, but also, uh, nature is changing dramatically, and we've seen that uh, just in our short lifetime. Uh, but what are we seeing here, and why is this hazardous to pollinators? Well, this is a picture of light pollution, which is something that's starting to be talked about um, more recently as a driver for some of that insect decline. Light pollution is the presence of artificial light in the night environment, and um, it can disrupt nocturnal pollinators and lead to reduced numbers of fruits being produced by plants um, that depend on that nocturnal pollination. And it can also disrupt pollinator life cycles. So if you've ever left your porch lights on and noticed all the insects that collect around it, they're hanging out there, but they're not going out and reproducing and eating and doing everything they're supposed to be doing. So that's factoring into the decline. So everything from the lamp type to the lighting regime and the distance from the light to plants can affect how um, that light is going to impact the pollinators. Yeah, it's amazing you brought that up because I never even thought about that. But when I was a child to be out at night, we'd have the lights on the porch. I mean, it'd just be, you know, dozens of different species all around the light. Mm -hmm. And I can leave my light on here and maybe have none whatsoever. So the decline is uh, very noticeable. Uh, but losing a monarch, I've been down uh, with the natural partners I'm on that board of uh, directors, and we collaborate with the Emerald Planet uh, International Foundation. And the monarch butterfly is our poster child. And we work very carefully with Canada, the United States, and Mexico on this. So why we need to really be uh, taking care of uh, the poster child of pollinators, the monarch butterfly, as a greater message as far as all species. Well, this is a species that, again, so many people connect to. So from Canada down to Mexico, I mean, the Day of the Dead is such an important cultural some, uh, celebration and monarchs are part of it. And it's just a, a species that a lot of people can, I guess, um, can have uh, have relationships with compared to something like a wasp. They're not as cute and fuzzy, <laughs> and it's harder to understand why we should care about wasp compared to something like a monarch. Mm -hmm. But it's just like flies and other things. We just have to have them. Uh, why is this in here as far as the decline of pollinators? So this picture, the picture on the left, is what was a showy lady slipper orchid that had been chewed on by deer. And um, essentially the deer just chewed off the flowers there. So 
deer um, over browsing is having an impact on plants. Um, they can remove those floral resources, which are the food for pollinators. They can also remove host plants, which is the nursery habitat for, um, for caterpillars, so butterflies and moths. And in some studies, deer have also been found eating caterpillars as a by byproduct of that browse. So. And <laughs> what are we so, seeing here? This is a monarch caterpillar, and um, as I mentioned on the last slide, host plants are important because they support the life cycle. And the lack of plants to support the full life cycle of organisms is also an issue. So sometimes when we're designing our gardens, we only think about the adults, the showy butterflies and the adult bees, but we also have to think about putting in plants that these caterpillars are going to eat or that the bees are going to nest within and, um, and essentially supporting the full life cycle instead of just part of it. So uh, we have just about 10 seconds left. It's very important that the wildlife and the heritage actually stays together then because they're mutually supportive of each other. Am I correct? Yes, it's very important to think about the whole ecosystem and the, the web. Thank you very much for being with us as we create the Emerald Planet. Looking around us, and we're talking about the loss of habitat, the loss of pollinators, which are critical as far as the food supply, and really taking care of all living beings on planet Earth. So it's the plants, the animals, the humans, and the microscopic uh, beings as well. Uh, but looking at pollinator conservation, how are we going to be able to bring them back if we can, and at the same time to protect what we have? This is the work of uh, Carrie L. Westhead. She is the Education Outreach Specialist for Wildlife and Heritage Services at the Maryland Department of Natural Resources. And she really is concerned about the broad spectrum as far as the plants and animals. Carrie, welcome back to the Emerald Planet TV. Thank you. Looking at pollinator uh, conservation and the Maryland Department of Natural Resources, tell us how this department really is uh, out there on a day-to-day -day basis, 24-7, 365, trying to protect the pollinators, but also to bring them back if possible. Well, we do a lot of work for habitat conservation. So conserving habitats and protecting them and removing things like invasive plant species to, uh, to make them more habitable by, uh, by our different pollinators and other wildlife. And then my role is doing education and outreach. And I do a lot of work with local communities and folks around the state essentially to how to how to create backyard wildlife habitat. That's absolutely fantastic. Now looking, we're going through the seasons and we'll see the different plants, uh, the uh, the animals as well, looking at uh, all the uh, different pollinators as part of the animal kingdom. Uh, but why do we need to look at it on a seasonal basis and not just say, oh, okay, this is uh, 2020 going into 2020s of the decade. Uh, why do we need to look at this on a season by season basis? Well, it's important to know that um, that pollinators are going to be out throughout the spring into the fall, and there's even some that are active in the winter. So if you want to help support pollinators, you have to support that whole life cycle and, and provide those different blooms at different times of the year like nature would intend. And so looking at the, uh, the different blooms that we're talking about, tell us what we're looking at here as far as the variety of colors, uh, even the styles of the plants, and what type of pollinators may be attracted to each of these. So these are all examples of spring blooming tree and shrub species. So when people think about planting for pollinators, they often think of, of non-woody plants, flowers to put out there, but a lot of the trees are out there providing those um, nectar and pollen resources early in the season. Like red maple on the right-hand side, in our area, red maple was blooming at the end of January. So mm -hmm. it was out and open really, really early for all of those early risers. Mm -hmm. Now looking at the other two plants, they're more subdued in their color. Are they actually attracting different types of pollinators? 
They are. So the one at the top is a viburnum. It's called cherry-leaved viburnum. It has these gorgeous and very fragrant white clusters of flowers. And that's one of our ground nesting bees that's enjoying it. So it supports a diversity of species, whereas the one on the bottom, the black willow, actually is um, beneficial to many of our specialist bees. So bees, there's sp specific bees that only visit the willows and get the pollen from the willows. And so they need that plant um, to be able to survive. That's fantastic. Uh, summer, of course, uh, we're looking at gorgeous plants here. Uh, but again, we're looking at the four seasons. So why is summer so important? And the types of, and variety of species of plants? Well, these are all summer blooming mints and I like to promote them because they're easy to find and easy to grow and um, they're very attractive to suites of pollinators, not just a specific type. So um, everything from spotted bee balm, which is in the top left hand corner, which likes really dry habitats and to the actual bee balm on the right hand corner, which likes wet habitats. They're supporting wasp and butterflies and bees and beetles and flies. Mm. So they're good to have about. Uh, so it's a great diversity that we're seeing here. Going these plants. Here are a few more um, summer plants. So on the left hand side, that is actually liatris. And that is a, a thread waisted wasp that's enjoying it. So they're one of our solitary wasp species that are pollinators as adults but their juveniles eat other organisms. So they're out there pollinating the plants and then picking off pests and feeding them to our babies. So, um, so they're really good to have around. In the middle is one of my favorite plants. It's called sweet pepper bush, and it's really attractive to a lot of butterflies. It's one of the plants that I suggest as an alternative to butterfly bush, which is an invasive plant that's from China. People often plant for butterflies, but it doesn't support the life cycle like sweet pepper bush would. And then the right hand side is pieweed, which is another replacement I suggest for butterfly bush. Yeah, let, let me keep this up for just a minute. Why is it so important that we really focus on native species and try to eliminate the invasive species? Because there's more and more invasive species. Uh, many of the nonprofit organizations that focus on the nature of the rivers, uh, the land are really now trying to eliminate invasive species. Why is it so important that we get back as quickly as possible to the native species that we have here in this region? Well, those invasive species are non-native species that cause problems. So not all non-native species are considered to be invasive, but the invasive, the ones that are problems are, are causing ecological impacts or economic impacts or even human health related harm or a combination of all of them. So, uh, so it really depends on the species. And for some of these invasive species, they may be attracting pollinators, like butterfly bush is attractive, but it's not supporting them because it's not providing them the necessary amounts of nutrients that they need for survival. It's not providing them any reproductive habitat like these plants would provide. So, um, so it's, it's kind of not really doing much for them, essentially. So really, it's important that we as humans, when we're actually planting our gardens or uh, we're living, you know, out on a farm somewhere, we really need to be cognizant of the plants all around us and the impact that each one of these plants, they may be beautiful to us, uh, very pleasing, but at the same time, they could be quite destructive to the pollinators. Very, very true. Yeah. So we need to look into this. So this is really a great topic, uh, Carrie, and thank you for bringing this up. Uh, looking at the fall. So these are different fall plants in the aster family. Asters are one of the largest families of flowering plants. And you can see the diversity of pollinators on these plants, everything from goldenrod, which brings in bees and wasp. That's a blue winged wasp. It's a solitary wasp species that also helps with pest control. And um, on the right hand side, that picture by Judy Gallagher is actually one of the flower flies that mimics bees. And much like the wasp, it does double duty. It pollinates as an adult and then it's juveniles, the maggots actually eat soft bodied insects like aphids. So when you're planting a diversity of flowers, you're gonna bring in the pollinators, you're gonna bring in those predators and you're gonna support these webs. And, and it's all about those ecological webs and, and helping more than just what you want. Um, it's, it's the things that are supporting that animal too. 
Yeah, and this, I'm really glad you brought that up because uh, we have these different species here are doing, as you say, double duty, sometimes triple duty. Uh, but for eliminating the pest, uh, why is that so important as far as uh, nature, its concern, and the balance of nature? Well, it, nature is all about checks and balances. And when something gets out of balance, like if we lose our, our predators, like some of our wasps, then those prey species are going to start exploding. They're going to cause problems. So it could be that they're going to start eating a lot of plants and maybe killing some off um, or, you know, having some other ecological impact. For example, with white-tailed deer here in eastern North America, we have more deer than we ever did before the European colonists came here. And that's because we altered the habitat to make it more conducive to deer and we got rid of their natural predators, the mountain lions and the wolves that would keep those populations in check. Right. So uh, it's all about the delicate balance of nature that we need to be uh, really concerned about. And, uh, and yet we can add beauty and still be improving the environment the same kind, I think is part of your message that you're sharing with us right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and these are all plants that even if you don't have a large space, the great thing Thing about pollinators is that you can put these types of plants in pots on a front step or a sidewalk or something like that and you can still have an appreciable impact with our local pollinators so you don't need big tracts of land you can start small and uh, and still have a great impact no we're just do something uh, yeah. looking at these plants so these plants right here um, one is cardinal flower um, that's the one with the green check and that's the straight species. And the other one is a hybrid of cardinal flower. It's cardinal flower that was crossed with great blue lobelia. And, um, and this, uh, I brought this slide in to show you an example of, of the problem with some of the cultivars, which are kind of those, those genetic crosses that are bred for human characters that are often on the markets. So the one on the right is bigger. It, it grows in a little more habitats than the, um, than the cardinal flower on the right or the left hand side there that's a little more finicky about where it likes to grow. So the hybrid's great and everything and in trials with hummingbirds, more hummingbirds visited it, but when Dr. Annie White looked at the nectar content of that, that cultivar, she found that it had 80% less nectar than the straight species. So that this is going back to just because something's being attracted doesn't mean that it's being supported. Yeah, that's that's just an incredible example right there. And tell us again, what is a cultivar? So cultivars are plants that are bred for human purposes. And so we select certain traits like disease resistance or longer flower blooms or essentially growing in um, a wider range of habitats. And we create these different types of cultivars. Some of them are crosses or hybrids between different species as well. You'll often see um, the name, it might say like Holly and in um, quotation marks, Nellie Stevens. And that's just telling you that it's that cultivar or that breed. So we need to be very cautious of what we're planning. Uh, just again, looking at the pollinators as far as the nutrition content of these plants. Mm -hmm. And if we have these cultivars that are less nutritious for them, then maybe we should not uh, be planting those. So leave the leaves, uh, all the things. Tell us what we're looking at here. We're running out of time. Uh, but the last question is, what do you see as far as how do we need to protect, conserve the pollinators for the future? And I'm just going to leave this image up and let's go out on that. we got about 30 seconds, Carrie. Well, planting for pollinators, you know, planting native species is one of the best things you can do, but you can also help support their habitat by leaving the leaves and creating other habitat resources for them to use. Again, thinking about what they're going to use for their different parts of their life cycle and doing it as nature intended, essentially. Mm -hmm. I'm going to uh, jump through these because I wanted to go to the uh, uh, this one right here. I'm going to leave this up. Uh, so, Carrie, uh, looking at what you're doing, what do you see for the expansion? And we got about five seconds. <laughs> well, uh, one great thing that you can get involved in is community science and documenting essentially what you're seeing in your backyards, documenting the plants that you have, the pollinators that are passing through. There are a lot of different projects that you can get involved in and help with national research. I think that the community scientist, I think, is a great program. 
Thank you for being with us. I carry all Westad as we create the Emerald Planet.